Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart, welcoming you back for another weekly market recap featuring, as usual, my good friend, portfolio manager, Lance Roberts. Hey there, Lance. How you doing, buddy? Hey, glad, to be, glad it's Friday. Uh, ready for the weekend, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, you know, not a dull week. Um, and look, folks, um, this is going to be a really organic, particularly organic discussion today because Lance, I recorded a special report uh, earlier before our recording here um, with John Maxfield and uh, Joseph Wang on getting the latest on what's going on in the banking system. Those are two very experienced banking analysts. I'll try to weave in some of the conclusions of that in this conversation, but did not have the chance to do my usual pre-prep for our meeting here. So we're literally going to be just- We're going to wing it. Winging it, operating without a net. Um, <laughs> But uh, what, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of interested to find out, actually. <laughs> um, but uh, lots of things to talk about this week. Um, let's start with probably the one that's going to have the most weight, which is uh, the latest uh, FOMC um, announcement. Um, the FOMC met. Uh, they hiked uh, another 25 basis points, which was largely expected. Jerome Powell then came out and talked for a bit. Um, you know, markets kind of equilibrated for a bit. Um, but then on Friday, they they decided they really liked what they heard. And of course, there was a, a big jobs report, a big jobs number that came out. What did you take away from, from the Fed part of this week? Well, so first of all, when the, the Fed came out and made their announcement, the markets didn't actually like that. We, we sold off on Wednesday. We sold off on Thursday. So uh, those two days, the markets really kind of took it on the chin as they realized that, A, the Fed's not going to be, yes, the Fed's not going to hike rates anymore. But more importantly, there is absolutely no indication that they're going to be cutting rates anytime soon. So that was pretty much a big disappointment to the markets. Friday, the market rallied because we have basically seven stocks that drive the market. Apple's one of those. And uh, blockbuster earnings report on Friday. Revenue still fell, by the way. Uh, they just weren't as bad as expected. So that was worth five points on Apple, which makes up a big chunk of the S and P return for Friday. Yeah, and and when I read that, right, I I, I saw the stock pop, and then I heard you know amazing quarter for Apple, and then I went and looked and said, well, actually, revenues were down, yeah. <laughs> but they were down from, uh, they, but they were above expectations. Right. And I was just hearing you in my head saying. <laughs> Millennials earnings season. Now it's millennial <laughs> revenue season. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, exactly right. Everybody gets a trophy. But, you know, look, it, the, the market was getting oversold on a short term basis. We've been, you know, kind of selling off. You know, remember week before last, we talked about getting our sell signals. Um, we had reduced equity exposure at that point. The market's been, you know, trending lower uh, over the last week. And we actually bounced right off that downtrend line from April. So, very importantly, from a bullish perspective for the markets, despite you know banking crisis and the Fed and employment reports and whatever else, uh, this market continues to act very bullishly. We've multiple times now we have come down, tested the 50-day moving average, tested that downtrend line from April, have bounced off of that with some volume and some strength, and that's the important message here. With this, the rally on Friday was a little bit broader in nature. Than we've seen lately. Now, breadth for the market overall remains pretty anemic. And so that's one kind of concern as we head into summer, that we have a very small handful of stocks kind of driving the markets. But, you know, but from a technical basis, the market continues to act bullishly. So we have to give that some, some bias in terms of our portfolios. Okay. Um, so, and I take it, from your position, of, from a technical standpoint, the more it, it goes down and tests that support and then then rebounds, uh, that's that, that those are bullish signals that okay. Well, yeah, yeah. So th th think about this way, it, you know, if you know, as markets come down and they test a previous level of support, right? So let's think about you know building a bridge, so to speak, right? So market comes down, tests that first level of support wherever it is, and that's kind of one board for the bridge, and then. We, we come down and we test it again, but we don't break it. We add another board to the bridge. So every time that the market comes down and retests these support levels, it's building on that support because what's happening is, is that all the market participants are starting to key in at that level. And so as all the algorithm, think about all the algorithms, all the retail traders, everybody else, they say, oh, every time we come down to this level, the market bounces. So I'm going to be a buyer. 
And that's where that buy the kind of that buy the dip mentality starts to really uh, kind of build a base. And so every time we, we come down and test these levels, buyers are willing to step in and buy the market. And, and that's why these technical support levels are important because it tells you where buyers are sitting and willing to buy, right? So when you have sellers that are willing to sell, prices are coming down, but there's buyers sitting here at this price down here going, well, when you get down here, I'm willing to buy it from you. And that's how markets work. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, look back to the Fed for a sec. So yeah. um, they hiked 25 basis points. Um, Powell, to my recollection, said, um, as, expe as I expected, you know, he basically said, look, I'm not committing to any more future rate hikes from here. We're, we're going to take a wait and see, very data dependent approach. Right. And I think that's largely, you know, beginning to lay the air cover for like, all right, folks, you know, don't be surprised if you get a pause, you know, uh, next time we meet. Um, it was kind of well, interesting. Can, can, oh, can, I, can I just say one thing? Yeah, yeah. He was very, so two things happened in that Fed meeting that were very important. So first of all, he's, he did make this statement that we're going to start focusing on incoming data, right? Yep. This employment report on Friday was 269,000, way above estimates. But most importantly, the employment cost side of that, the wage growth side of that was very strong. It was up half a basis point. So incoming data suggests that the Fed needs to hike rates more. So you know, while the Fed said that, you know, we kind of gave this hint that they're pausing, it was more of a hawkish pause than it was a dovish pause. It wasn't, mm -hmm. see, if, if Jerome Powell had come out and said, ladies and gentlemen, we're hiking 25 basis points, we believe that interest rates are now sufficiently restrictive enough to bring inflation down to our target rate. If they had said that, now that's a dovish pause. That pretty much says, we're done. He didn't say that. He said that we're now going to, we're hiking 25 basis points, but we're now going to focus on incoming data and to ensure that inflation is coming down to our 2% target rate. That's a little bit more hawkish. That leaves that door open. I'm not saying he's going to hike rates more, so don't misinterpret what I'm saying. Yep. He left that door open for another rate hike at some point, maybe not the next meeting, maybe right. the meeting after that, whatever it is. So, right. so it, a little it, bit little very nuanced right i'm glad you, you you brought that out and look while while i think and i believe you have thought like me for a while that he should pause he'd also be an idiot to close the door on additional rate hikes right so he, he's he's say, saying the right things but what's interesting for those that are really hoping for a pivot and what's been so interesting is market expectations for the pivot have just been all over the map and they switch ridiculously from like yeah. every couple of days right i mean I think yeah. last yeah. week when we talked They'd gone all the way back out to like November or December. They're already back to like July, June at this point in time, right? Now, I don't know. I haven't looked at it since the jobs report came out this morning, but that's got to pour again cold water on pivot hikes, right? If you've got potential wage inflation concerns, and you said the, the wage growth component was really high this time around, um, but also just, well, I guess let's talk about the job. Well, before we, we get in detail on the jobs, um, but it was just, it was a really big blowout number. It was a three sigma beat, right? So if he's basically saying, look, I care more about price stability slash taming inflation right now than I do about my, my full employment mandate, this gives him, you know, plenty of green light to, you know, remain hawkish, whether that's hanging out at five and a quarter now for the rest of the year or potentially hiking more if he needs to. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, I, I just feel like those pivot, those pivot hopes, you know, are, they're incredibly volatile right now, but they still seem to be a little bit more enthusiastic versus the data we're seeing here. No, no, they're still pricing 180 basis points of cuts. They're talking about they're talking about Fed funds going from five eight uh, five percent to three point eight by the first half of next year. That's a huge cut in rates. And again, as we've said before, the only way that's going to happen is is if the Fed's having to come in and fix something they broke. And you know, and right now. Yes, we have banking issues going on, but the market really is absorbing that very well. I mean, you know, you would have expected with another potential bank failure sitting there, uh, this market would have been down two, three, four, five percent over the last few days. And, you know, you rallied two percent on Friday on the back of Apple earnings. So, you know, it, the, the market is really doing very well in terms of absorbing these impacts versus what, you know, a lot of the, you know, the, the media in particular over the course of the last, you know, six months have been extremely bearish. You know, uh, these all, you know, all these things are cataclysmic. We're going to have this deep recession. I'm not saying that we're not going to have a recession or anything. I'm just saying that there's been a lot of very negative sentiment 
on the overall market that just hasn't come to fruition yet. And that's really starting to frustrate you know, both sides of the, of, the, of the participation. We have a record short level. I've got an article coming out on Tuesday. We've got a record short level on stocks and a record short level on treasury bonds. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Everybody's yeah. bearish on everything. <laughs> so. Well, and so, I mean, this is, this is part of where I want to go in the discussion. I do want to finish the Fed before we go here, though, but is like, you know, I just had Michael Howell on the program this week um, who tells, who's very bullish. Um, and he, he believes that the turn has happened. The market turn has happened. I also just interviewed uh, a, a very successful investor, Dan Tapiero. Um, that interview will launch next week. And he basically is, is right in the same camp as, as Michael. And, you know, I asked Dan, I said, look, you know, we, we, we went from unprecedented liquidity and, and, and all time kind of, you know, bubble distorted highs in the market to shutting off the liquidity spigots. And we have all these this litany of issues that you and I have talked about every week here. And I'm like, are you basically saying that all we got is what we saw last year? And he's like, yep. That's, that's what I'm saying. That 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 was it. That was the market correction, right? So let, let's let's save that part of the discussion for a little bit later here. Good. Because I yeah, do want to finish think, up on that. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. Yes. Yeah. We, we, but we're at this point right now where I think you're getting really intelligent people who are seeing really different things right now. So it's a really hard time for an investor to try to figure out what's going on because you're 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 seeing lots of smart people say lots of different things. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure for your case, it's got to be really hard as a capital manager. Again, let, let's get there. Because there, there, there's nobody smart on my side, so we're just all talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but but one of the things I took away from the FOMC um, press conference was that. Uh, it was not a bunch of softball questions for Jerome Powell this time around. You know, no. people were actually really kind of pro in him pretty hard. Yeah, and did I, I don't know, did you watch the actual press conference? I watched, I didn't watch all of it, but I watched good chunks of it. I was kind okay. of multitasking. No, no, that's fine. It's fine. You know, what I took away from that was, is that you, you're absolutely right. The questions that were coming in were not the typical Softball question. You know, one thing is like always like when President Biden gives his, you know, his Q and A because he already has the answer. He already has the question. Right. Here's the, the guy's question. face and the answer. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you know, these questions were coming at Jerome Powell, and and you know, what was interesting to me, and you know, there's a way to tell when people are lying, right? You you can watch eye movement, you can watch body posture, you can uh, one of their, their, their tell, lips move. Yeah, I, I, yeah, that. but that's what it's politicians. <laughs> Um, but you know, one of the ways to tell that somebody is potentially not telling the truth is, is A, if they repeat the question, and two, if they stutter, stutter and stumble a lot. And I'm not saying that Jerome Powell was lying. I'm, I'm not making that statement at all. But you know, when you're when you're very confident in your answer, the statement is very clear. It's like you ask me a question, Lance, what do you think about this? I believe in my answer and I, I can answer the question. I've never seen Jerome Powell stutter and stumble as much as he did through that press conference. And I thought that was kind of an interesting tell. Either A, he wasn't prepared for the questions that were coming in, or he was really trying to figure out a way to thread that needle to keep markets from, you know, over, you know, becoming overly exacerbated with the situation. I think it's the latter only because while the questions were tough, they were all questions that you or I would have asked. Like, I mean, easily anticipatable questions, right? Um, but um, I mean, even yeah. Steve Leisman, who is always, you know, he's always the clown puppet, you know, from CNBC. So, you know, he even asked tough questions. I was like, Steve, did yeah, you have I say, to, same with Nick Timrus. the wrong side of the bed this morning or what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Nick Timrus, I'm trying to remember what question he asked, but it was pretty probing. And I was just yeah. like, wow, all right. You know, like you're you're risking your little you know, most favored journalist position there right now. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a new guy for the Wall Street Journal now this week. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess I'm just trying to think, is there anything else that we want to clean out uh, or clear out on the Fed side before we move on? Um, uh, I, I guess not, except, you know, I guess I did. Um, well, it's interesting. Uh, I saw eye, roll, eye rolls on FinTwit and then, you know, social media to Powell's repeated reassertions that the banking system is resilient and, you know, there's nothing to worry about there. And I understand the skepticism. I totally understand the eye rolling. I, I will say, having just come from this 
special report recorded earlier today. And by the way, folks, if you haven't watched that or are interested in this, I highly recommend you watch that after this video. I'll put up a link to it right here. Um, but talking to uh, both uh, John and uh, and Joseph, um, it uh, you know they're 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 kind of of the mindset right now where it's like yes, some other banks may indeed fail from here, but this isn't a contagion situation. Um, the the banks that have have failed to date were the most vulnerable for you know idiosyncratic reasons for for most banks, and um, and honestly the the headlines seem a lot more dire than the real reality on the ground. And what's interesting about that that pairing of people is Joseph used to work at the Fed, so he really understands the plumbing of the banking system and how it works and and what the the central planners can do to you know put duct tape on the system and keep it going where Jonathan speaks to banking executives for a living multiple times a week, probably multiple times a day. So he's really like got his ear on the ground to, you know, the pulse of the, of the banking sector. And um, they both say, look, you know, this, this stuff happens. Jonathan gave a really good historical overview and said, look, anytime that you have a big liquidity spike and we have had them at multiple points in U.S. history, you have a readjustment of the system, almost kind of Lance, like your example of the rubber band that you pull too far, right? And, and, and when you come off the liquidity spike, you, you generally always have some banking failures. And he said, look, what we're seeing right now is it's really not that different from what we've seen you know, time and time again. And it, it, it peters out after a while, unless you've got something really systemically wrong, which we don't seem to have at this point in time. And so you know, they were, they were I don't wanna say that they were dismissive of the concerns because they weren't at all, but they basically said, this actually may be providing a good investing opportunity for for folks that are willing to put some capital at risk in the banking sector right now you know so what they were saying is 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 given how dire the headlines are right now and how how um nervous uh you know the the general kind of you know gestalt is around the banking system right now that there may be you know a lot of baby getting thrown out with a bathwater effect going on here and that um you know the sell off is providing an opportunity to maybe get into some really robust um, banks at favorable prices right now. And they're saying, look, you don't have to go down the quality ladder. You don't have to be trying to determine which of the small regional banks that are getting walloped right now are going to make it. Um, you know, like you, you, if you want to speculate, you can do that. But you can just buy some of the bigger banks right now because the overall banking se sectors, you know, come off a bit on price right now. And you can buy potentially really robust high dividend paying stocks for a better valuation that they've been at for a while and then, then ride the recovery. So anyways, I just- well, You know, it's a good point. And this is something Mike and I, as an extra, so a couple of things, first of all, is that I always think it's funny that, you know, we'd say, okay, this guy used to work for the Fed, so he really only knows the plumbing. That's great, but the Fed never catches these banking problems before the fact, right? Yeah. So- And, and we and, did and talk the, about that too. <laughs> right, right. And so, you know, the Fed, even, even Jerome Powell recently says like, hey, we missed it. Right. You know, we, 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 we screwed that up. And then same thing on the banking side, these bankers have been through these cycles before and they never see it coming and they always get caught short. So, you know, it's, it's one of those kind of interesting dynamics that, you know, we go to the experts of the business that have never caught these things in advance. But, you know, the one thing to, to keep in mind here, so, you know, and again, we've been doing a lot of research, you know, internally looking for, yes, and we agree, absolutely. Not every bank is going bankrupt. Uh, you know, so, you know, where do you start digging around? Well, you look at companies like, you know, Truist Financial or, or Co-America or, you know, Capital One. And you find out when you start digging into these companies, they have a lot more liquidity risk than you realize because their tier one capital ratios aren't that far, you know, in the green, so to speak. I'm not saying that they're undercapitalized, but they don't have a lot of cushion. And so the, the problem is not the depressed asset prices on, you know, that they own. So, so again, you know, just a quick recap for everybody. When you make a deposit at the bank, the bank then loans that money out and they have, they only maintain a very small reserve of that money they lend out. So the money, that, so when I make Adam a loan, I can't go to Adam and say, oh man, uh, we've had a lot of withdrawals. I need, I need you to pay off your loan today. Can't right. do that. The only thing I can do is go sell these assets that I've bought over here, which are typically, you know, treasury bonds, you know, mortgage-backed securities, those type of things. But those have all come down in price because the Fed's been hiking interest rates. So I've depressed collateral values. 
that now I have to go sell these depressed collateral values to meet these withdrawals. And so what happens is it's really a function of not saying, oh, the bank is fine. That's not really the issue. The issue becomes the stock price because it's not just the fact that, that we got two things that are going on with these, with these mid-sized banks. The first is, is that depositors are going, hey, what the hell? I've got $100,000 over here. I can move it over to this money market fund, which is not run by the bank, and make 5% on my money. So now that deposit leaves the bank. Okay, so now I've got to give that client this 100000 That leaves my bank. I've got to sell assets to cover that 100000 Then the other problem is, is the stock price starts declining because of all these rumors in the market that all these banks are going to fail. So what do, what do depositors do? Man, I'm at you know, ABC, you know, regional bank. They may go under. I'm going to move my money to JP Morgan. I know I get zero on my money market, but at least I'll have my money, right? So- there's, so the, the, the decline in prices is also causing outflows of assets, which then compound this problem even more on this tier one capital liquidity side. So it's a multiple compounding effect. And, and I agree with, with their statement that we're probably going to see some more banks in trouble. You know, the Fed can bail this out at any point, basically by doing a form of QE and just saying, hey, look, you've got depressed asset prices. You need to sell it. We'll buy them from you at full face value. Right, so which is what they've done. System. They've started well, doing with these failed ones, right? Really not. Yeah, kind of sort of, Adam. But what they did was they said, we'll make you a loan based at 100 cents on the dollar of collateral. I'm talking about a QE version of this where the Fed just says, hey, we'll buy your bonds, right? So kind of like QE where they were buying treasury bonds from the banks for quantitative easing. They do the same yep. thing here saying, hey, look, if you need to sell your assets, if they're trading at 70 cents on the dollar, doesn't matter. We'll pay 100 cents on the dollar for them. And then we'll just hold them on our books to maturity and get our money back. Right. Right. Which, so, you know, it, it, it's interesting because I remember talking about this when Silicon Valley Bank went down. Like it, like it is kind of interesting as a as a rescue uh, step. Right. Because those are, as you've said, in many cases, money, good assets. Yeah, right. Yeah, they are. Um, uh, now, you know, the question is, is why don't we just do that all the time if that, you know, works well? And, and of course, that ends up creating moral hazard and encourages banks to take on more risk than they should and all that stuff. So I'm, I'm not necessarily <laughs> recommending it. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we always have to do these bailout programs after, you know, bad behavior at the banks. And, yeah, no, exactly. And look, sometimes that's just how you find out where the landmines are is you, you step on them, right? Yeah. Um, so, so I, I kind of get it as a as like a like an emergency thing. The problem yeah. is, is you don't want it to then become a, a yeah, you don't want to become, thing, right, exactly. which is what always happens. But yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But no, I mean, so my point about all this is, is that, look, you know, there is going to be there's a lot of banks under a lot of pressure right now. The trick is going to be to pick the right bank or two or three. So, you know, why if, probably if you wanted to invest in the sector, look, if you're trying to really make a lot of money, buying KRE as an example, uh, which is the regional bank ETF, is not going to make you a lot of money. You know, that, that could double in value. I mean, it's, it's really so beaten up. We could see that rebound, you know, pretty sharply over the next couple of years. So you can certainly make some money in something like KRE. And I'm not making a recommendation, by the way. This is not a recommendation. Um, but I mean, if you really want to make some serious money, you would go pick up two, three, four of these regional banks, do little small positions and two, three or four of them. One of them's probably one, two of them may fail. Two or three of them may work out and you'll probably wind up making some, some decent money that way. But, you know, trying to pick the, the one bank is risky because you really just don't know at any point, you know, which one's going to show up and go, you know, I'm done. Yeah. And, and just to be super clear, um, you know, what these guys were saying is, is, Look, you, you, you know, we're not we're not saying go speculate and chase and try to, you know, pick the one bank that that might recover from all this. They were like, go buy J.P. Morgan, you know, like, well, is, which is fine. Go, it's go just, buy the big guys. Yeah. And that's fine. You're just not going to make a lot of money at it. All right. I mean, J.P. Morgan hasn't come down that much. You know, Wells Fargo hasn't. You know, these the big banks, everybody knows their their money good. Right. So they're, they're systemically too big to fail. So they're not they're not declining that much. I mean, you take a look at it like a Truist or, you know, uh, Comerica. These stocks are down 40, 50, 60 percent from their peak. So, you know, that's where the money's going to get made. It's not going to you know, if you want to bet safe, yes, by J.P. Morgan all day long, you'll be fine. 
right? Yeah, and, and I think they're saying like, look, you're going to get paid a nice dividend, and you know, the JP yeah. Morgan's off what, like, eighteen percent or something like that uh, from a time. Yeah, it's maybe. It, I don't. I don't even know if it's that. It may. I haven't looked at it lately. But yeah, I just. I just looked at the numbers here. I'd say 18 percent or whatever, right? So there's just like, but but yeah, but that's the super safe way. And then to your point, there's yeah. there's other points along the continuum yeah. here. Yeah. There's 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 uh, there's regional banks that will double in value over the next twelve months, right? If you happen to find the right one. Right, right. And, and again, to, to just to underscore their point, and I, I, I don't want to totally rat hole in this, but they were like, look, the, the biggest risk right now here is just the, the fear that the herd has right now. Yeah. Right. And kind of to your point about, hey, we see the stock price going down, so we get even more frightened. Right. right. Now, what's yeah. kind of interesting is they said, um, uh, you know, obviously things that got uh, players like Silicon Valley Bank and, and First Republic is they had a lot of their deposits concentrated into few hands, right? And so you you lose a few deep pocketed depositors and that actually makes a big difference, right? And most regional banks have much bigger retail book of business. And so they're much more resilient uh, as uh, as a result. But they they said that with the capital flight that's been going on, the deposit flight that's been going on, I said it really isn't all that visible in the average retail account. Um, you've got you've got commercial, you've got high net worth, and then you've got kind of the regular people. And they're like on the commercial and the high net worth, yeah, that's where a lot of money's been been fleeing, right? Yep. But but average people aren't really running to the bank and uh, you know yep. demanding that they take all their money elsewhere. Yeah. And no, they that, said that that's actually not uncommon. That it's, it's it's pretty sticky. There's enough friction there that it takes an awful lot to get a lot of a lot of regular people to do that. Yeah, you, but you got to remember, a lot of regular people don't have a lot of money. So you're talking yeah. about ten thousand, twenty thousand dollar accounts. What what hurts you as a bank is when you know that's easy too. I've got enough inflows. So again, how does the bank work? I make a bunch of loans. So Adam's got a loan. He's paying his interest payment every month. I've got plenty of cash flow coming in to cover a ten thousand or twenty thousand dollar deposit. Uh, withdrawal, right? What I can't cover is those $5 million withdrawals all at once. And more importantly, like with Silicon Valley Bank, you literally wake up, over on, you go to bed on Friday, wake up on Monday and 40 million have left your bank. Right, right. And that, that's why they were that's, hyper vulnerable yeah. to this. Yeah, I'm just saying like, you know, from the headlines, you would think like, oh, maybe like 10%, 20% of, of regular people are taking, you know, their deposits. That doesn't sound like it's nearly on that scale. So to your point, look, here, here's kind of an interesting thing. I'm actually working on an article right now. So forgive, forgive my charts. They're a little bit rough here. I haven't quite finished dressing them all up just yet. Uh, this is money market funds by type. And this big blue area in the middle, which you can see is the vast majority of money market funds. Those are institutional prime money market funds. This is where corporate, you know, Apple, 130 billion in cash, Warren Buffett, 130 billion in cash, whatever. That's where that money is. The, that, that is corporate money. That is high net worth investors. Those minimums are generally a million dollars to get into those money market funds. You can kind of see down here, this little yellow area. You can see how that's expanded recently, uh, a bit. Money market fund. It's a very small amount of money. To your point, Adam, you know, the average retail mom and pop, they're, they're not, you know, they're, they're just trying to go to work every day, come home and pay bills. And they've got a little bit of money, you know, stuffed away in a savings account in the bank. Um, you know, they're not running around trying to capture a little extra yield on their money. Right? They should be, right? But, you know, they're just trying to live their life the best they can. So, you know, but what's really moving the market, what really impacts these banks is when this big money, that big blue area starts to move into yep. money. That's, that's what causes these problems. And you can see this big spike. In money market funds here, and I can here. I can, let me show you this next chart. It kind of cleans it up here a little bit. Um, but this is this is total money market funds, and you can see just over the last really since March, you can see this massive run up in money market funds. The last time we saw that was back in 2018, 2019, when we had all that liquidity come into the markets. Um, you know, prior to that, it was actually pretty flat going back to 2011. So you know. Um, and this is also kind of important because you can see here in 2011 through 2018, money market funds were kind of basically stable at $3 trillion. So there's all this you know, rumor all the time. It's like, oh, that money market money is going to come flying back into equities. That never really happens. <laughs> it's just money markets generally there for corporations to pay for um, you know, employees and rent and labor costs and healthcare benefits and buying inventory and all that stuff that money generally never comes back in the market. You even see that 
you know, after that big run up in 2020, where every you know, remember there was the PPP programs where we sent money to companies to keep them in business. So you see that big run up in capital in money market funds. And even during 21 and 22, during that big uh, 2020 and 2021, with that big surge in the market, money market funds really didn't drop off a whole lot. A little bit came out, but not a whole lot. And then since 2022, it's going back into money market again. Yeah, interesting. I, I would imagine that this chart has been highly correlated with M2 last quarter, last couple months exempted. Yeah, it is. Right, because like M2 basically never contracts, except right now it is. But in general, you know, you, you, to your point, you're not seeing money flow into money market accounts and then flow elsewhere, like back into the stock market. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, that, so the, the, so to your point, Adam, you know, really what impacts the banks, it's not the retail mom and pop. It's when you get big depositors taking their money out to go buy a mutual a money market mutual fund, right? And that's what puts these banks in stress. And so when these prices start to decline and companies get worries like, man, if that bank goes out of business, you know, I'm not going to be able to pay payroll. I'm not going to be able to, to meet my obligations or whatever it is. They're taking, they're taking that money and even they may be even going to JP Morgan getting zero on the money, but at least they know they'll be able to make payroll come the end of the month. Right, right, right. Um, but I guess what I want to underscore on this point that we're making here is, and again, this was echoed by the, the guys I talked to earlier today, um, is they're like, yeah, you know, like banks have generally always paid less <laughs> Uh, than prevailing, you know, uh, the prevailing federal funds rate. And oh. they're, they're, they're able to get away with it uh, in, in most cases. And, and most people just don't, there's just too much friction in the process for a regular person to kind of care or, or they're, they're, they're perceived, the perceived amount of friction. And my point, I just want to underscore here is that for the proactive, in, you know, conscientious investor, like the folks that watch this channel, you actually can, you know, with a little bit of attention and a little bit of proactivity on your part, you can actually, you know, get superior returns on your cash uh, in ways if you just kind of pay attention and are willing to go through a few extra hoops, but not too many. And this is why having a good advisor can help if you're giving them all your capital to manage, or if you want to do it on your own, you know, like, I, I can't tell you how many people have reached out to me over the years, Lance, and you probably heard the same thing. They're like, oh, I've been sitting in cash for so long and I'm waiting for the market to turn. And you ask where their cash is and their cash is sitting in a bank earning, you know, literally zero, where you're like, wow, with, with just a few clicks on Treasury Direct or by moving this to your brokerage and putting it in a market, money market account there, you could be getting like thousands of extra dollars a year on this, right? So I just want to underscore the point that like taking charge of your destiny this cash management element is is one area where quite often a little bit of work can can actually make a pretty meaningful difference. Yeah, no, we 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 actually have a portfolio that we build for uh, corporate clients uh, where we do cash flow management um, because there is you know so many opportunities for a business to maximize their cash flow. So you know you know think about it this way: you're a business that produces a widget, right? So I I have to buy product and I have to sink capital into this building this widget, and then I sell my widget, and then I've got to wait 90 days, you know, to get paid or whatever my my time frame is for that money to come back in, and then I get I, what I get back is I get my basically the the sell of my widget plus my profit, right? So that's where you know I, I make money. But for a lot of businesses that are smaller in nature, that time frame waiting for that money to come back is very problematic because they still got to pay bills and rent and all these other things in the meantime. So we actually build accounts where you know we can invest that capital, create a higher rate of return on that. They borrow from their own account to do these purchases. And then while that money's out, they're getting this interest rate deduction to manage their cash flow better. They've got access to their capital. And then when that capital comes back, it continues to build this cash flow pool that they've got that they're building over time. So it continues to give them bigger and bigger lines to work with so they can sell more product. And that's that's the whole goal at the end of the day. But cash flow management is an extremely uh, important part of a business. And this is but this is also why, you, you know, there's so much money sitting in bank accounts that are paying zero because of that banking relationship, you know, businesses in particular, need a good banker. You know, there's three, in order to be successful in business, you need a good accountant, a really good lawyer, and a really mm -hmm. good banker. And if you have those three things, you're going to be successful. But 
you know, if you take all your money out of the bank to go seek into a money market fund, that's great. But now your banker doesn't like you so much. So, right. well, and you've also it, lost all the banking services like payroll and all that stuff too. Sure. Right. And, and sure. And so there's there's a lot of money sitting in banks not earning any money. You go, well, why is that? Well, it's you got to remember there's also a relationship aspect. And yes, JP Morgan is a good example, pays 0.02 on, on their savings accounts. They're getting paid five from the Fed. That spread is called net interest income. That's how the bank makes their money. Now, they're making a gross amount of money. I think it's funny that we go beat up on energy companies because they're making all these profits. You know, banks are ripping off customers left and right. <laughs> Nobody complains about that. But that net interest income is a huge spread for revenue for banks like JP Morgan right now. Yeah, well, I, you, well, you and I have complained about it often in the past on this program. <laughs> um, but I, I, and I, I just, I just want to hit this point one last time because I, I want to get you to make any comments on it you want. But yes, cash flow management very important for companies. You just explain why, but it's very important for individuals too, right? Yeah, that that, that, that have enough cash for this to be meaningful for. Right, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, if you've got a hundred grand sitting in cash that you're Look, you know, one, one of the things that we do in financial planning for all of our clients is that we set up what we call a, you know, a, you know, Dave Ramsey calls it an emergency fund. We call it a buffer fund, you know, but what it is, is that you just need a pile of cash sitting somewhere. It's not invested in the market. So you don't want to subject it to risk. It's not investing in something illiquid. So you don't go buy bonds with it. But, you know, you have 100,000 in cash or whatever, you, whatever your year's worth of income is, right? You want a year's worth of income kind of sitting in this emergency resource fund. That way, if you lose your job, whatever it is, because whenever something happens that you're going to need to tap this emergency fund, you don't want that money invested into the markets because probably the issue of you losing your job is also coinciding with a recession in the market. So, you know, this is one of the things, though, that, you know, if you have, you know, uh, you know whatever your income is, you want kind of one year's worth of income sitting aside and that you can put into a money market fund because it's liquid. You don't want to put into treasuries because that has lack of liquidity. If interest rates spike up, potentially you lose money and you have to sell your bonds at a loss. You don't want to buy stocks because typically if you just lost your job, we're probably in a recession or some sort, stocks are down. So don't invest that money in anything that can lose principal. So, but you know, have that emergency fund sitting aside. And yes, to, to Adam's point, a couple of clicks. Move that to an online bank somewhere that's FDIC insured, stayed under your limits of 250, but get a higher yield on that money because you might as well. It's just sitting there for an emergency anyway. All right. All right. Uh, okay. W well said. Um, the, the only other thing on banks I'll mention before we we finish here. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're going to get off banks eventually. <laughs> eventually. But but this this is a little bit, of, I know it's going to trigger a rant response in you. Um, <laughs> so one it. of the questions I, I did ask was, you know, talking about the difference that at least used to exist between insured and uninsured banking deposits, right? And and asking the question that, hey, you know, it seems like they're kind of a, a lot of people are are making the implicit assumption at this point in time that based upon the recent rescue responses from the Fed and the Treasury and the FDIC, that now all bank deposits are going to be insured going forward. And it, it did kind of surprise me the answer that that John and Joseph gave gave where they were like, yeah, that that seems like it might be the case now. You know, I was I was, I was kind of expecting to think that like, no, we're making too much of an assumption here, but they were like, no, I I mean, that seems to be with it. And so the question I asked was like, okay, like is that possible? And is that a good thing? Like or is that just magical thinking? Like Okay, yeah, we thought that there should be a distinction between insured and uninsured deposits, but no, we think everybody, like, can we afford to do that? Of course, the FDIC fund we know is an insurance fund. And, you know, if too many banks go down, that fund runs dry real fast, right? So, you know, what is this backed by? And they were like, it's probably just backed by the, the money printer at the Fed at this point in time. Well, so, it, you know, it's all it's TBD. All yeah, it's all backed by the taxpayer, ultimately. I was trying to explain this to somebody the other day. It's like, well, no, the FDIC, that comes from fees. Yeah, who pays the fees? Taxpayers. Right, taxpayers. Right? So, I mean, only in the day it's on us. But, you know, J.P. Morgan, you know, the acquisition of... Uh, of uh, First Republic. Thank you. First Republic by J.P. Morgan, I thought was a classic example of just the nonsense that goes on. Uh, you know, J.P. Morgan will eventually... We'll have one bank eventually. You know, the, you know, the old Highlander series. They're loyal, but they can only yeah, be, can be one. Only one. Yep. Uh, the, that's going to be J.P. Morgan eventually. It'll be J.P. Morgan, and they will also be the Federal Reserve. It'll be one bank in the same. Yeah. Uh, 
but you know, it, it, you know, typical kind of crap, right? The, you know, first public goes belly up, and and this also sets a precedent, by the way. Uh, I'll tell you in a second. But J.P. Morgan goes, oh yeah, we'll buy it. You give us a discount on the assets, so they bought the the, the assets at a discount and no liabilities. So the liabilities were taken over by the FDIC were five, $15 billion that FDIC had to absorb. So what a great deal for J.P. Morgan. See, somebody with some cojones in Washington just said, no, J.P. Morgan, you want the bank? That's fine. You can have all their assets. Okay, we'll give you the assets at a 15% you know, discount, but you also get the liabilities. You have right. to pick up the whole tab. You don't get to pick and choose. And see, this has now set a really bad precedent. Because now when the next bank fails, or let's, uh, let's, let me back that up. Re let me restate that. So now when the next bank gets in trouble, right, instead of a bank showing up going, hey, you know what, um, before, you know, bank ABC goes out of business, I'll buy, you know, let me, let me acquire them, right? I'll acquire the assets and the liabilities and we'll just make a merger, right? And we'll just keep everything okay. See, they, they've now killed that possibility because now every other bank is going to sit there and go, well, We'll just wait. Right. We'll wait for the fire sale. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and we'll just wait, let them go under, and then we'll get to pick off some assets and no liabilities. The FDIC will step in, absorb liabilities, and, you know, hey, it's all good for us. You know, the, the, the First Republic is going to add $100 million worth of revenue, or, yeah, like $100 million worth of revenue in the first quarter of the acquisition for J.P. Morgan. You know, yeah, it was a great deal for J.P. Morgan. So, yeah, buy the bank because, you know, they're going to be there. But, you know, that, but we're setting really bad precedents with all of this. I mean, it's just it is not good fiscal management by government. It's not good policy by the Fed. It's not good policy by the FDIC. And then somewhere in some case, somebody's going to start standing up to these banks and saying, no, if you want these assets, you're going to buy them lock, stock and barrel. OK, see, I knew this was going to trigger a little bit of a rant from you, which is why so I get off banks because now I'm all upset. So go ahead. <laughs> well, it's just funny. You've probably seen the same headlines I've I've seen recently where they, they now call J.P. Morgan J.P. Moore gain. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and, and you're right. You know, I mean, what we, we've we've provided. I, I talk a lot about the importance of incentives um, and we have now provided a disincentive for the banking system to self-heal. Uh, instead, uh, they just, you know, th this is this is like classic, the criticism that folks say about the banking system where it's uh, privatized gains and socialized losses, yep. right? We basically just said, oh, yeah, this is our new process for socializing the losses. Yeah. And you get all the tasty assets and, oh, the, the loss stuff. Well, that the FDIC will pick that up, which in, in your purview, you know, just says, well, the taxpayers will take that up at the end of the day, yep. right? Yeah, and, and you know, look, and the FDIC and, and the Fed had a great opportunity to diversify the banking sector a little bit more, right? Sell it to anybody other than the top five banks. Sell it to PNC, sell it to Truist, sell it to, you know, Comerica, sell it to Capital One Financial. You know, we need to diversify our banking system away from five banks. You know, we have five stocks that drive the market, five banks that control the banking sector. You know, you've got to basically start, you know, diversifying that base. You can't keep selling everything to JP Morgan, you know, Bear Stearns, everything well, else you, you, as it comes you, out. You can't just dump everything on JP Morgan. And you can if you, if you want to create a highly concentrated, unfair system. But yeah, oh, exactly. <laughs> um, exactly. And okay. I'm curious, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a bank expert, but, um, you know, in certain cases, you would hear people say, well, look, this was, you know, one of the biggest regional banks. And, uh, you know, a lot of other regional banks maybe couldn't swallow or, or, or you know, afford to pay, pay for the to acquire the whole thing or the whole thing. Um, it might be true. Well, my question is going to be whether or not that let's assume it's true for a minute that that, that would be yeah. difficult. Couldn't you just slice it up and say, OK, that's, great. That's they're, the they're just they're just assets. So, OK, right. smaller bank, you get a fifth of their assets. Other small bank you get. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly what I was calling that the bunch of hooky because again, you don't have to say, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. You might actually have to come to work uh, and actually work for a couple of days to get this done, <laughs> uh, rather than just you know calling it in from your desk on you know on some beach and say, oh, just Jamie, you buy them all, just you yeah. know get it done with over with. No, you you break it up, and again, uh, again, that makes our banking system more sound. You give some of the assets to some of the banks, some assets to the others, you know, you break them up by region. Look, we've got depositors in, in California. So uh, we'll pick a bank out in California, M&T Bank, whatever, and we'll give them some assets. We've got some depositors over here in Florida. So let's give them some assets. 
you know, you break it up and you start, you know, you start giving these mid-sized banks a little bit better foothold in the economy. A, it makes them more sound. It gives them a bigger footprint. It makes them more stable long term. And it diversifies our banking sector, which is more advantageous to the consumer. Right. It's a win win for everybody. But instead, the easy solution is just to give it to J.P. Morgan. Yeah. All right. Well, I lied. One last thing on this. That's just gonna, <laughs> gonna, gonna, gonna make your blood boil at an even hotter temperature. Um, you know, I asked the question about like, um, OK, so, you know, banks are overseen by the individual Federal Reserve regional banks. Right. And Mary Daly, who is the Fed president of the uh, San Francisco Fed uh, Bank, uh, which is responsible for the West Coast, including California, um, has having a really bad batting average this year, right? <laughs> She's got most of these most of these big banks are banks that are under her purview, yeah. right? That that are going under. And so I just sort of asked, like, all right, you know, do you think she's going to be long for this role? You know, do, does does she bear some you know responsibility here? And uh, both of them, but mostly Joseph, who's much closer to the Fed, he was just sort of like, yes, in, in, in a in a real in a just world that would work that way. But he's like, you're talking with an institution here that doesn't like to admit fault, and uh, and it's sort of you know like Teflon when it comes to accountability, and so we shouldn't really be expecting much to stick on anybody here, which is infuriating to hear. Yeah, it is. I'm not, I'm not gonna rant on it. I'm just gonna let you get to the next topic. Okay. <laughs> um, well, we talked about the payrolls earlier and I, I just want us to dig into this for a moment because um, uh, it's it's a big beat. Uh, the markets are, are clearly responding to it in, in, in addition to uh, some of the big you know, tech earnings like Apple. Um, the, the payroll number uh, was a big beat. It, it, uh, the, they rose by uh, a little over 250,000, which was a, a really big jump from the March number. I'm going to put up a couple of charts here. Um, one is to show that, that okay, we're now, this is the 13th consecutive um, beat, beat versus expectations, right? And when you look at that versus a historical chart over the past uh, you know 20 years or so, um, it just stands out. Uh, just blatant uh, departure. In other words, we we haven't had a stretch of beats like this ever in in this twenty plus year data series. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's a six sigma. No, sorry, a three sigma beat. Um, so it is it is a statistical standout that that we would not expect. Um, but what's interesting too is is kind of the gist of this article, which I that I pulled these charts from, which is coming from Zero Hedge, is showing that. Um, uh, you know, what, what seems to the game that seems to be being played here is um, really big positive number that smashes expectations. And then when you release that number, you also release the revisions to the previous few months worth of data. Yep. <laughs> and I'll put up a chart here. You can see for January, February, March, um, non farm payroll revisions were all to the downside. Um, and, uh, you know, some people, I'm not going to necessarily say this is exactly what's going on, but, but are saying that this is just sort of intentional window dressing, uh, to just make things look better than they are, you know, for the administration to have something to point to and say, Hey, we're doing a good job here. Um, but whether that's true or not, if the data is doctored intentionally or unintentionally, and, and we know from the way in which, you know, the calculations of this are reported is that a tremendous percentage, uh, of, of the numbers that come into this are calculated, right? Yeah. Their estimates. Um, so we 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 know that that there's a lot of just kind of finger to the wind stuff going on here. But this is data that policy is being made based on, right? Yeah. Well, and that's why you know when the Fed looks at things like you know employment, they also look at some other sub indicators that they look at jobless claims, which are clearly rising. They look at continuing claims, which are clearly rising as well. Um, you know, you take a look at, you know, the inflation data, they looked at trim mean PCE, which is still very sticky. So, you know, the Fed's look, you're, you're absolutely correct in what you're saying. I mean, you know, the jobs report is a main input into their financial decision making. And again, that number today was, or, you know, or sorry, yesterday, sorry, uh, that number yesterday was, um, you know, certainly not Fed friendly in terms of bringing inflation down. Um, I wrote an article today talking about you know, the Fed's biggest fear is wage inflation. And you've got that problem. You know, you look at the employment cost index, we've had a huge surge 
in that side of it, which is, is going to keep inflation more elevated than what the Fed thinks here, at least for Walls, just simply because of this money that's still in the system coming out of that 2020, 2021, you know, injection of capital, that's still there supporting, you know, prices and, and also these higher wages that we're paying is having a trickle up effect in the markets. And that's also going to weigh on inflationary pressures. Okay. Yeah. So um, I don't know. I mean, you and I have taken these jobs numbers out to the woodshed, you know, many times in the yeah. past, so we don't need to do it again here. Um, but it is frustrating. Uh, <laughs> it, but well, it, it, it's frustrating. And look, um, I, I'm, I'm not trying to say that the jobs number, uh, the real jobs number is a lot worse than than what we're being told. Al although I can easily argue that. And, and, I, and I do think it's, I, I do think that's probably likely the case. Um, but, you know, what bothers me is that we just don't have good data Right. It's it's like we are we are in well, it feels like we're intentionally monkeying around with the instrumentation on our cockpit dashboard, right? Which I just don't think is ever smart for anybody who wants to fly safely <laughs> to any yeah. place. And why I keep looking at employment so frequently and I bring it up week after week after week on this program, um, largely goes back to the Michael Kantrowitz framework where hope, you know, is hope framework E is the last uh, stage of the, of that framework. And in many cases, as goes the employment numbers, will go the economy in terms of whether we're going to go into recession um, or into a new up cycle here. And so to have bad information or bad signals, uh, signals we can't trust uh, on the employment side of things, um, you know, I, I just think is really dangerous um, to everything, you know, in terms of uh, true price discovery, you know, efficient markets, but just helping people decide what actions to take yeah. today versus what might happen tomorrow. But, but again, so, so I'm not disagreeing with you. Okay. So take that for what it's worth. Um, <laughs> but look, but, the, but <laughs> I'm, I'm, all I'm going to say is, is that whether it's the hope framework or whether it's any other type of framework that you're working on, the employment data is the employment data is the employment data. It's what we have to work with. That's the input into all these factors. So if the employment numbers are strong, whether you agree with them or not, it's strong employment, right? And look, and ultimately at some point in time, we will likely get negative revisions. I'm not discounting that at all. But for right now, what the markets are going to respond to is that data for what it is, better or worse. And we can we can parse it all we want. We can make all these assumptions that this is bad and that's bad and this is a lie and that's bullshit. Um, but at the end of the day, the markets are going to respond to two things, right? Is the economic trend stable and earnings growing? And, you know, earnings actually picked up from the last quarter's low. So from fourth quarter to first quarter, earnings have improved. Not saying, but you know, so the initial take from this earnings season is that A, earnings are better than expectations, and B, it looks like earnings dropped in the last quarter. So, to you know, this idea, you go back and look at stocks, they dropped in October of last year. So, stocks have dropped in October of last year, earnings have dropped in, in the fourth quarter of last year, and employment's remaining strong along with economic growth. So, right now, GDP now is at 2.7% for the second quarter, coming off 1.1% for the first quarter. So, you've got this, you know, you've got this improvement in economic activity and earnings growth, which definitely suggests that the market is on the right trend here. Now, again, we may not agree with all the data, but the data is what we have to work with. Oh, um, you, you actually just caught me by surprise there by citing GDP now, because well, last week when I cited it, um, it was down at like one point one. something. Right. Um, that was in the first quarter. No, so no, 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 no. It was the start of the second quarter. Oh, the start of the second quarter. So yeah, yeah it's, I believe it, it's 2.7 now, if I'm it, not mistaken. It is 2.7 now. I just pulled it up right after you said that. So okay. um, yeah, no. So you, you, you raised the point that I was, was making my way towards, which is, um, I mean, you've said this before many times, right? You know, we, we, we we don't get the luxury of of you know investing for the markets we want. We we have to invest for the markets we have, right? And um, we gave a little bit of nod to this earlier, but um, you know there are now increasingly intelligent analysts who are saying, hey, you know I've got indicators or you know have my own data that I'm looking at that say that it's time to actually start getting bullish here um, yeah. and. I know that that's going to sound anathema to a, a, 
certain percentage of people who are watching this video and have heard us rant for you know years about a lot of the the secular fundamental issues that we are dealing with right now. You know, a lot, a lot of those issues are still very much in play right now. Um, yeah, exactly, it's very yeah. confusing. Yeah, and so it's a very confusing time. And I, 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 I guess you know, let's talk about that for a moment here. Like, it's just we, we are at a time of, and you had mentioned this. I think several times earlier that this is one of the hardest, if not the hardest times to to trade in your investing career because the path forward looks like it could take so many different directions right now. Um, but uh, I, let me put it this way. Nobody knows what's going to happen here. Um, I, I think you, you, you have to you have to take a balanced approach and however you're allocating it to say, look, if my primary thesis is wrong, do I have enough exposure on the other side uh, of the table that I'm not going to get wiped out if my primary thesis is is, is turns out not to be correct? Um, but but let's assume just for a second here that um, folks like Michael Howell and Dan Tapiaro, who I mentioned, let's assume that they're right. If if they are, this is the moment where you deploy, you at least start deploying capital um, and buying into this market because this is where the valuations have yet to catch up to what they think you know is is coming ahead, right? It's the time to you know be greedy when others are fearful, right? And I want to be super clear right now. That is not my <laughs> statement right now that this is the time, but I'm saying that we are beginning to see signs that. It, it it could be right now if it is i will feel just as as uh angry at the universe <laughs> that we did not get the cleansing effect that we need to get a lot of the malinvestment out of the system and do i think that just looking at you know equity asset prices do i think that they are historically overvalued still and all that yes none of that has changed but i, I i'm 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 willing to ho to hold the uh, the alternative in my head along with my you know existing assumptions and to have a debate and to begin to challenge my assumptions and say, hey, maybe do I want to be doing anything different based upon some of these new inputs that are coming in? So, Lance, I want to give you a chance to talk about this because you've done a good job of this on this program of saying you have to you have to keep your eyes open to what may be happening, even if it is definitely what you don't think should be happening. Exactly. No. Look, so, you know, you know, it's a really interesting point, right, that you just made. So let's let's just play some assumptions here for a moment, right? Valuations are still elevated, right? No doubt about that. Earnings have come down a little, but if you look at the long-term trend of earnings growth, earnings are still 20% deviated above their long-term growth trend line. That's unsustainable long-term. Uh, so I'm making so I can make very easy cases why you know the market could come down some more. But here's another thing to think about, and this is we're talking about here. So first of all, let's go back to 2020 for a moment and think that, and actually we have to go back a little bit further. Let's go back to 2018. So in September of 2018, the Federal Reserve says, hey, we are nowhere near uh, tight enough interest rate policies. In fact, Jerome Powell's words were, we're nowhere near the neutral rate. And that was in September of 2018. The market declines 20% into the bottom of, of 20, uh, 2018. Mm -hmm. At that point, Donald Trump says, hey, you know what, dude, I'm going to fire you as, as Fed, you know, Fed president. You're, you're done. And so Jerome Powell, wanting to keep his job, quickly changes his tune and says, oh, yeah, we're right there at the neutral rate. We're good. We don't need the hike rates anymore. And in fact, we're probably going to be cutting rates sooner than later. By June of the following year, in 2019, they're cutting rates to zero. Then, so now this is an important part of the story. So just follow with me for a second, right? Because this all makes sense in, in a moment. So then in 2019, about September, the National Federation of Independent Business Survey comes out. And I wrote an article at that time saying, recession signals everywhere from the National Federation of Independent Business. Recession will be here within six to nine months. The Federal Reserve at the same time is doing this backdoor repo to bail out Citadel and a bunch of other hedge funds that were, that were short on liquidity at that point and needed access to funding. So we had this massive surge in repo through the last half of 2019. Now, everybody saying at this point, it's like, well, nobody could have seen the recession coming in 2020, right, when we shut down the economy because of the pandemic, but all the signals were there. The National Federation of right. Business, what was going on with the Fed banks, everything else. And as is always the case, right, you got to have the structure for a, for a recession. You need a trigger. And that trigger was the pandemic and the shutdown of the economy. 
hadn't all this other stuff not already occurred, it's possible we could have shut down the economy and just had a really mild recession, real short, and you know things might have been different. But because of that shutdown and these other weak structures in that point, we had this very deep decline. And then we hit the system with liquidity. Now, here's the point I'm making. Everything that we're looking at now, and we're going, all these things say we should have a really deep recession, are a bit skewed because of what happened in 2020. We front look, we, we manufactured a recession that caused this deep economic drawdown. We laid off all these employees, 50% you know, drop in employment, the whole nine yards. So now these companies have hired people back. Nobody wants to fire people, right? Uh, our business, we don't want to fire anybody. We've got good employees. And if we fire them, we're not going to get them back. They're going to work for somebody else. So there's what's called labor hoarding going on right now. That's one thing that may be contributing to these, you know, kind of sustainably high employment numbers that we're seeing. We are seeing labor force participation rates increase. That's also important here. So all this stuff that we've been expecting to happen may be offset somewhat by $5 trillion in liquidity and this front-loaded recession that we had last year. And remember, normally when the Fed's hiking interest rates, stock prices are declining and you're having a recession uh, You know when the Fed starts cutting rates. Normally, I'm, I said that backwards, let me rephrase that. <laughs> When the Fed is hiking its rates, normally stock prices are increasing because of momentum in the markets, right? Everything's going up. We're in a bull market. Everything's great. The Fed's hiking rates to slow down the economy, but that right. really hasn't impacted anything yet. But this time in, in 2022, the Fed's hiking rates and markets are going down. So we front loaded that drawdown in equities as well. So now we're to the point where we're pausing. You know, we're seeing this kind of stubbornly strong economic growth. And, you know, all of a sudden, we've kind of gone through this recessionary, you know, kind of earnings drawdown that now at least appears at the moment. I'm not saying it has, but at least it appears to have stabilized at some level. So if that's the case, this market could have bottomed in October, as we said, and, and, and to your guest point, the bottom may be in. But that doesn't mean, here's the, here's the point I want to make. That doesn't mean that there's a, a, another 12 years of 15% a year advances ahead of us. It just means that maybe we've seen the bottom of the market. We could see because valuations are still elevated. Earnings are still above long-term growth trends. Profit margins are still above long-term trends. You know, some of those things have to go through the function of economic growth that drives those things. I can't have, you know, massive profit margins if I'm having 2% economic growth. Those just don't jive with each other. Right. So we may be into a period where stocks don't go down, but it doesn't mean they go up a lot either. You know, we could be in a year of where returns on an annualized basis are no longer 12% a year like they were from 2009 to 2020, which was four percentage points above the long-term average from 1900 to, 20, to 2009. But maybe we're going to be in a period of five, six, seven percent rates of return, which are normal, by the way. <laughs> But those are going to seem like they suck because you're so used to 12% returns in the markets over the last decade. All right, Lance. Well, well look, it did, you know, build off of that. So um, I, I think back to a term that Brent Johnson made recently on this channel, which is that, um, you know, he wouldn't surprise him at all if markets continue to go violently sideways from here, which is the term that he used. So you're chuckling at that. But yeah. um, I mean, it, it could be. And, and, and John Hussman, and I know that you're not saying this, Lance. But John Hussman's models still project basically 0% returns Never. for the next decade, total returns, right? So it's not that it's a flat line. Um, you know, it'd be much more sort of a ping pongy, but but kind of range bound. And, and voila, a decade later, your markets really haven't gone in very far. Yeah, um, absolutely, absolutely right. And that's, you know, vol I think we're about to see potentially a period of volatility that, you know, is going to be, you know, where you have 10% you know, up years followed by, you know, 5% down years, 10% down years, followed by another 10 or 15% up year, followed by a 10% down year. I mean, that kind of, you know, that could be all be entry year. I mean, you could have a 10% gain, it goes to a 10% loss back to flat, you know, by the end of the year. I mean, it's enough to make you nauseous, but that's the type of market we could see here for a while. Yeah. And that really underscores a theme that, that you and I have been mentioning, but, but a lot of the experts that I have on this channel have been mentioning now for well over a year, which is, Look, you know, you, you you remove the great financial crisis from the data, and from you know, two thousand and one to twenty twenty one, 
yeah, it was pretty much a straight elevator ride up, right? Um, that uh, that era is is likely over now, and um, but passive investing strategies work great, right? And so we have a whole investor class that's that's very used to passive investing, right? Where the type of environment that you're talking about here, active investing becomes much much more essential uh, to both making gains but protecting them as well right so you know in, in this type of environment and i know with this observation kind of you know talks your book and and talks wealthy ons in terms of recommending people to advisors but it's a big reason why we do this which is to say it's a different playbook than what most folks are habituated to right now so if you don't know the new playbook then find somebody who does and draft off of them yeah and look, look, I think this is also really important about expectations as well from investors is that, you know, market volatility is is market volatility. And that means, you know, prices move up and down. So, you know, regardless of what financial advisor you work with, you know, don't go in expecting that in a down year they're going to make a lot of money um, or in an up year they're going to make a tremendous amount of money. You know, maybe they'll get lucky and do that once or twice, but you cannot find you know, really an investor that can repeatedly do that over time. You know, what you're looking for is somebody that can perform when markets are going up and mitigate losses on the way down. Still means they're going to lose some money, but just not lose as much as the market. But, but in a, in a, and this is going to be especially important over a decade of time where potentially you have the zero rate of return. The what will make the difference between you netting out zero and a loss is mitigating those downsides. It's not the upside that matters. As long as you're making some money on the upside, that's great. But if you mitigate those downside losses, those upside gains in the years you have them will compound and you can net out a positive return over a 10-year period, which is what the goal of investing is to begin with. But don't have unreasonable expectations because that leads you to taking on way too much risk that in a volatile market will really penalize you heavily. Um, great point. Actually, there's an interesting headline I want to talk to you about volatility in just a second. But just to build off that point there. So I would expect that you would encourage people when looking at an advisor to look at average returns over time versus, hey, what'd you do last year or the year before? Because what tends to happen a lot, human nature being what it is, is you look at the guy who had a killer year last year and you say, great, I want to put my money with that guy. And, and not only is it highly unlikely that they're going to potentially be lucky again if they were lucky there, but but you, you what you're doing there is you're putting yourself at a disadvantage to reversion to the mean. Right, which is what investors do all the time. You put your money to the person who outperformed, and math just says, "Hey, he had an outperform year. He's probably going to have an unperform year pretty soon." Right, well, and so a great example of this. Right, last year, um, you know, in 2021, we said you know that energy stocks were really undervalued. They've been really beaten up. There's likely going to be a big outperformer. They were a big outperformer in 2022. Then at the end of last year, everybody was piling into energy stocks, and they're the worst performer this year. So. Next to banks, I think banks have finally caught up with them. But you know, um, you know. But to your point, that's it. Is that, you know, the worst mistake that people make is chasing last year's returns. And this is also important. We talk about average returns over time. Never look at one, three, five, and ten-year returns uh, that Morningstar puts out. Those are the worst metrics for measuring portfolio performance because that assumes that you started one, three, five, or ten years ago. If you started anywhere in between those those levels, your returns will be vastly different. Um, so it's important to look at every year's returns relative to the market, averaging that out over time and saying, OK, look, this manager and there's some great mutual funds out there that have just, you know, you, you see these reports every year. It's like 80 percent of mutual fund managers that performed their index last year. OK, so just go index and that way you can have average returns. That's all you're going to get. Right. You'll get market returns by, by investing indexing. Um, less your piece. You'll still underperform. Um, but there's some mutual fund managers out there that if you invested with them 10, 15, 20 years ago, you have slaughtered the stock market they, because they are great managers. But did they outperform every year? Absolutely not. Did they lose money? Absolutely. But over time, they've killed the market over time by, by mitigating those downside losses and creating returns when they can in up years. Okay. Um, real quick, just before I, I forget this, then we're going to move on to our last topic and get to your trades. Um, I just saw a headline right before I came on with you. I don't know if you saw it earlier, but um, apparently some mystery, mystery investor just put down a, a $5 million bet that um, VIX is going to rise to 70 at some point here. 
Um, so just because we're talking about volatility, who, who knows if that bet's going to pay off, if it does more power to that guy, that's a, that's a really bold bet. And, you know, what's you fixed be, at right now? 15? 15. You gotta be careful with that though, Adam. I mean, those make great headlines, but you don't know the context, right? So let's, let's just presume for a minute, I've got a hundred million dollar portfolio and, you know, I've got some gains in my portfolio this year. Markets are up, you know, uh, seven, 8% this year so far. And I want to hedge some downside risk. So I go put on a $5 million short position or a $5 million position on VIX to hedge my long position. So it's that, but the headline says $5 million bet that VIX is going to go to the moon. Right. But actually, I'm just mitigating some risk in my portfolio. So, you, it, it, so the problem with these headlines are they're great, but they're taken out of context. Now, if the guy's just, you know, balling it and saying, I got nothing else, I'm just going to bet $5 million on this, then that's a move. That's gutsy. So yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And, and look, I don't think we know. Like I said, it was yeah. sort of a mystery investor. I'm not sure if they know why. And it could, it probably likely is for a reason like you're talking about here. Yeah. But but it does underscore um, the fact that volatility, as measured by the VIX right now, it has been extremely suppressed. And and there may be some elements to that with the advent of zero day to expiration options and whatnot. But um, uh, sure. I'm not so sure the VIX is telling us what we think it's telling us because of that. Yeah. And, and I guess that's kind of where I wanted to go here. So we talk about a more volatile you know, period ahead. Some people might say, oh, great. Well, then I'll just trade volatility, right? How do you do that in an environment where the VIX may be broken? Well, you, look, so there is no, I mean, you know, look, the easy way to say this is that if you're, if you're the retail investor, if you're just doing this on your own. I would not try to trade volatility. And, and there's a couple of reasons why. The, the first reason is, is that the only way to trade volatility and really do it well is to actually trade the, the VIX options, right? So you've got to take on a, a bit of, of risk to do that. And, and, I, and, and the problem with trading options is, is that there's plenty of historical data. 90% of all options go to zero, right? Yeah. So the odds of you making money trading volatility index is very risky. The problem with trading ETFs is like, well, I'll just buy a volatility ETF. The problem is, is that they have the options in those ETFs and those options expire. And there's this time decay of premium on those options. And there's, uh, you know, these, these, and they have to be rolled over, you know, on every period. And that, and when those expire worthless and have to be rolled over, well, that eats into the return of the VIX. So if you buy the VIX, if you happen to buy it just right and volatility spikes the next day, it'll work for you, especially if you're doing leveraged ETFs. You've got to time those just right because any time that you have to hold those for a period of time, that internal role of those options eats away at the profitability of that ETF. And so it does not perform. You can overlay the VIX versus these ETFs and they're not a match. Uh, you don't get that big upside bang that you're looking for. So the only reason to really, the only way to really do it is to trade the actual VIX options. And I just, you know, it's really, odds are, unless you're really adept at it and really know what you're doing and, you know, have an understanding of the capital you're putting at risk and why you're putting it at risk, I, I would recommend you don't do it because you're probably going to wind up hurting yourself more than you help yourself. Unless okay. you get lucky. Again, look, you could get absolutely lucky. Time it just right, make a bunch of money. Sure, Good job. any anybody can get lucky. Uh, yeah. we, if we could bottle that, we'd be gazillionaire. Consistency is the key. Yeah. So, right. so, but I'm just curious. Like, does the buying options on VIX does that does that even work in in a in an era now where we're not sure if the VIX is even doing its job? Well, no. It's like, for instance, everybody's trading zero DTE, and I just read. I was just reading an article. I think on Wednesday or Thursday. Um, most of those retail traders that are trading zero DT options are losing money in them. Yeah. So, you know, it's just, and at some point, it's just you either run out of money or you, you're, or you get lucky. And so that's all right. It, it, we're getting a little short on time, but if, if we could, if you could actually, could you just give the 60 second explanation of zero DTE options and, and why we went to this new system, like why, why, why they were introduced recently? Uh, they've been around for a while, actually, um, but they just become very popular because it's a, it's a great way to speculate. So, look, options are out there all the time. So, like, for instance, uh, I, you know, Apple's going to report earnings next quarter again. Right. So they just reported earnings. And so they're going to report earnings, you know, three months from now. 
So I can go buy a call option as an example, which is just an option to, to buy you know, shares at some future price and on a specific date. And that's all, that's all an option is. It's just a contract between two people, Adam and I, right? We do a contract between each other. And we agree that if Apple is at X price on X date, Adam will sell me his stock. Otherwise, he keeps his stock and I have paid Adam for the right to buy his stock at that price. And so he also gets money from me for that. So I lose all my money if the, if the stock is not at that price. If it is at that price, I get to buy it from Adam and he sells it to me. So that's that's basically how call option work. Put options are betting on the downside. So it's exactly the same thing in reverse. Yeah. But that's and, 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 and traditionally, they're, the, the contracts are kind of monthly contracts, right? You buy monthly, next month, right? yeah, it, yeah. You can go out further and buy leaps and stuff, but but generally the, the timing frame was in months, right? Yeah, yeah. you can go to Yahoo Finance as an example, uh, pull up a stock symbol and then go to the options tab and you can see all the call options for every given month, right? And, you'll see, and, and there's basically a strike price of where the option is expected to be on a certain date and then the, the, then the buy and the sell price, right? So it's all there for you, but you, you can see this. And I don't really get complicated with all this, but normally options are kind of future dated. Well, what everybody started doing is, hey, look at what I can do here. This option, and this started a while back, um, we would be going into a, to a, like a triple witching or and it's a Friday where futures, index, and stock options all expire at one time. And so we have these on the third Friday of every month, all these options expire. Well, what people are doing is going in the night before and then betting on how that option would, that stock would trade the next day. And they were buying these options with a very, with less than 24 hours to maturity. So, and then as this kind of gained momentum, everybody says, hey, well, we can just issue these things. And so now we have daily options and these zero day to expiration. So it's less than 24 hours to the maturity of this option. So people are trading these options on a daily basis, just basically betting on where the market's going to be. So just to imagine, say, Adam, um, market closed at X price today. Where do you think it's going to open on Monday, right? Or close on Monday? And you say, well, I think it's going to rally on Monday. It's going to be 4,200 on Monday. And I go, well, I think it's going to be 4,000 on Monday. And so we can make that bet, right? And that's all we're doing. We're just literally betting on where the market will open or close, you know, next week. So for for like a regular retail investor, is, is is trading these just basically like day trading on steroids? Yeah, it is because it's high leverage, right? I can buy a hundred shares of an S and P index for a very small amount of money, and if I win, I can make really good money at it. Yeah. All right. I mean, this to me, this just sort of has the smell yeah. of for, for, for the. I, I can understand that institutional trade. There might be reasons to do this for you know other trades you're taking and whatnot. But for the average retail investor doing this, to me, this is no different than just pulling the well, lever on the slot machine. You're, it you're, is. You yeah, have absolutely. no control over this. You have no inside angle on what the market's <laughs> going to do in any given day, right? Exactly. And remember, the guys that are selling you the option, they're generally hedging something else. They've got, you know, these are the, you know, the options makers. They're basically taking orders in from somewhere else saying, okay, I'm a, I'm a you know, $2 trillion asset manager and I need to hedge off you know, X amount of percentage of risk in my in my portfolio. So I'm going to sell these options against my portfolio to hedge some risk. Well, you're buying those options. And so there's generally, a, a, a you know, somebody on the other side that's probably better prepared than you. And this is why, again, most people trading zero DT options lose money on the retail side. But, you, but think about it this way. Your odds of winning, you know, are 50-50. You could be right, you could be wrong. Maybe you make fifty percent if you're right, but you lose hundred percent if you're wrong. Right, right, and that's and that's that's the the risk analysis you have to make. If I'm right, how much money can I make versus losing everything on this trade? Because that's what's going to happen. I mean, the the the, the risk of that fifty percent risk of loss is hundred percent loss of your principal. You might make some money on the fifty percent if you're right. Okay. Is it is it fair to say? I'm going to make an extreme comment, but just yeah. to put a coda on this, is it fair to say that? The viewers that are watching this, regular retail investors, if 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 you're if you're gonna trade zero DTE options, um, you should just do it with house money that you you're comfortable losing. Like j just just go into it knowing that it's just pure speculation, like going out and buying a lottery ticket today. See that 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 doesn't work for me because I hate losing money. Period. Um, but yeah, this is what we call Vegas money. So think about it this way: you know, when you go to Vegas, your wife says, "Okay." 
you can spend, you know, right. $500 in Vegas, right? Do not tap the credit card. Do not put the mortgage up, right? So, you know, that's, you know, you're basically going to bet money that if you lose it, you know, yeah, you're, you're, it's not going to, you know, devastate your lifestyle, right? It's not going to wipe out your investment account. It's just like, oh, I lost it. Um, but the important thing is, is just always remember that when you lose a couple of grand, you know, you go, ah, it's just a couple of grand. And it's like $30,000 worth of retirement money if you'd invested it properly. Yeah. So That's don't ever right. write off those two grand losses because they mean a lot long term. Yeah. That doesn't yeah. mean you're not going to lose a little bit of money. You know, that, I'm not talking about where your portfolio declines a little bit in your term. I'm not taught, you know, my portfolio was down five grand. Let's say, you know, I've, I've lost 50,000 retirement. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about when you lose something by taking on a speculative bet that goes horribly wrong. Yeah, this is funny. This is the investing lecture you're giving, which I give my older daughter who's at college and, you know, has her first credit card. Uh, and, you know, I talk about the $350 pizza, right? Like, yeah. like don't, don't just use it to get the pizza now that by the time you paid it off, you know, the whole thing's going to cost you interest and everything, you know, ultimately about 350 bucks. Right. So great point. All right. Um, well, look, uh, we're going to get to your trades in just a sec, but in the spirit of risk mitigation, um, it was interesting. Um, I, I, I was going to talk about this anyways, but I just saw a, a tweet that Muhammad Al Aryan uh, put out talking about how, um, you know, JP Morgan just took over, so uh, JP Morgan sent communications out to First uh, Republic uh, depositors saying, hey, here's what's going to happen over the next couple of days. And they said, look, if you get calls or texts from JP Morgan Chase or First Republic, it's not us. We're never going to you know, recommend that you send us money via um, online tools like Zelle um, or wires or electronic funds transfers. And the reason for all this is there's just a rampant amount of fraud going on right now um, of scammers, you know, trying to build people out of, uh, you know, their money, but targeting uh, financial brands like that. And I got to say, Lance, you know, same thing's been happening with myself and a lot of other players uh, in in uh, the online Twitter space, or people who have followers. Um, I get pretty frequent reports of, you know, people that are uh, imposters that are trying to impersonate me, you know, they've copied my Twitter handle, and they've just changed one little letter or period or something like that to try to fool people. And what's very common is, is they reach out and they start a conversation, and the person's like, wow, hey, Adam, I'm, it's great to hear from you, right? And then they have a long conversation that it ultimately winds its way into, oh, hey, I've got some great crypto model I'm really excited about got great returns you interested and then they try to get people to, to share their funds um this is a big issue and it's it's i know it's a big issue for the social media social media platforms um to try to you know get their arms around and they're not doing a great job of it right now which is why i want to have this quick conversation is just to warn people that um uh look it's going on there are people out there that are trying to use other people's brands and personalities to prey on you and I just want to underscore that, you know, you'll never hear from me and Lance, I've, you've said the same thing on this channel. You'll never get directly solicited over social media from myself, from Wealthion, from RIA, or from any of, of our other uh, financial advisory partners that are on this program. Um, but it, you know, it's amazing. And, and I, I know, Lance, I think some of your clients have, have recently lost money to a few of these scammers as well. Um, it, it's, they're pretty good at playing on, you know, yeah. people's emotional weaknesses or, or I mean, they're, they're, it's, it, it's surprising how many smart people still find themselves becoming victim of, of scams like this. No, absolutely. And, and look, these, you know, this is why, look, I, I, I threw a big fit a while back because, you know, I was like, I'm not paying for verification on my Twitter account. Right. And, and I was like, this is ridiculous. Why would, you know, I don't care because I, because social media to me is, is like stupid. Um, but, you know, it, you know, it's it's a good resource for people and I can put out comments and we can put out research and those type of things. But I was like, I'm not going to pay for that. And then shortly after I said that, and this is always the problem, right? I stuck my foot in my mouth. Um, we actually had a client get scammed and it, it thought he was talking to us at this point and, you know, was looking at an account, had my picture, had my banner, you know, had copies of my tweets on it. But it only had like 12 followers, which was, you know, kind of the first hint that it might not be me. So, you know, but overlooked all that, right? Just assumed it was me and, and got sucked into one of these scams. You know, and this is why we've said before. So that's why I paid for verification. So if you ever get something from me and it's not from my verified account and, 
you know, and I'm and I'm soliciting you something, it's not me. <laughs> it's because I will never solicit you. I'll never, you know, tell you to do something or send money or anything like that. And in fact, I probably won't respond to you much at all because. I'm actually working most of the day and not on social media. So you're welcome to leave comments. I might get back to you. I might not on Twitter. If you want to talk to me, email me off my website. I answer every email every day. That comes directly to me. So if you get a response from me from that, you will know because it'll be my email address. Yeah. And, and let me let me just add on to that too, which is, look, if you're ever at the part where you are going to part with some of your money for whoever you, you're engaging with about some sort of transaction, absolutely verify, right? Pick up the phone, email the headquarters, whatever, and just make sure that indeed the party that you think you were dealing with can verify and prove to you that they are who they say they are, because that's that's where the ball seems to get dropped in the most painful way in these types of scams is, is once the person sends the funds and then they get that pit in their stomach of like, oh my God, wait a minute, did I just get duped? You know, a little bit of pre-verification could have saved the expensive lesson of sending your your funds off into the ether. Yeah, and, and look, this is this is one of the benefits of of literally working with a financial advisor, which is we go through a lot of of training. Uh, like we have consistent updates that we have to do to our training for SEC regulations. All of it is involved around scams and email phishing and and all these things because it's all about client protection, right? About protecting the client, their data their accounts, their money, these type of things. And so like if you, if you are a client of ours and you email and say, hey, I need you to wire $20,000 to here. If you call and leave a message, we can't act on any of that. We have to call you on the phone and say, Adam, got an email from you says you want to do this. Is that is that what you want to do? Yeah, I want you. Okay, well, you need to sign this form. I'm going to send you this form on a secure email. You sign this form and send it back. Then we'll wire the money for you. But in a, in a case of a client that did get defrauded, you know, pay attention to what your bank says. You know, he got into this, this issue, tried to send the wire. The bank kicked back the wire and said, this is clearly a scam. And he forced the wire through anyway. You know, if, if the bank is telling you it's a scam, it's probably a scam. If, the, you're a, if your advisor is saying, don't do it, don't do it, right? Maybe it turned out that that investment was the greatest deal on the planet and you would have made a million dollars and you could be mad at your advisor all day long for him talking you out of doing it. But 99.9% .9 of the time, he's going to tell you the right thing and, and probably keep you out of trouble. And not losing that money is a lot more important than maybe the one time that you would have made money on something. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Lance. And, and look, folks, the reason why we're bringing this up is, is not because it's not just important message to deliver generally, but you know we have heard some reports of people that have become real victims of this. And so it does happen. We want to try to minimize uh, that from happening again. Um, all right, Lance, we'll look at the just, oh, just, real, real quick, just last point. If it's something on social media, just <laughs> don't do it, right? I mean, there. There, there is nothing good going on with social media. There's a great, I had a research article, uh, sorry, a, a research chart on my Twitter account the other day, which is funny because it's on social media, but it basically linked, um, you know, teen suicide rates and teen depression. And it says since 2010, there's been this massive surge of teen suicide and teen depressions. You know, when uh, Facebook came public was- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And yeah. so- you know, the like, rise of, you know, the rise of social media has made people more, you know, more isolated, more depressed, more sad, more, you know, and, and more victim because you don't have a way to actually verify these issues. And there's a lot of senior elderly scams that go on through social media well, and, and, as well. And a big reason why I'm bringing this up, folks, is, you know, you're all seeing the headlines now about what's going on with AI. But I mean, AI Proceed at an exponential rate, and that means it gets faster and better. It, it gets better at an accelerating pace, right? And so um, uh, it's just going to get harder and harder because they've they've already have examples of, of cases where AI was used to basically mimic a family member's voice. You know, calling a grandmother and saying, "Oh, grandma, I'm I'm in jail and I need money right now, or else they're going to throw me in prison." and um, and, you know, answers questions just the way that, that you would expect your family member to answer, right? And of course, that's only going to get better as AI improves. Um, and, and in fact, just to, just to show you a, a, an example of how convincing it can be, I just posted a video uh, or retweeted a video on, on Twitter 
uh, where somebody did a deep fake of Jerome Powell um, coming coming back from uh, his press conference the other day saying, oh, okay, guys, everything I said to you was wrong. Here's what I really meant to say. And it's it's hysterical. It's funny. It's very off color, just FYI. Um, <laughs> yeah, except that you... But but it's pretty good. I mean, like you can kind of see it's it's a, it's been manipulated. But like you know, if you didn't know who Jerome Powell was or you know whatever, like it's it's not bad. It looks pretty convincing. It sounds just like him, and you can imagine how great it's going to be in six months. How much better it's going to be in six months or twelve months, right? So, um, the 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 risk of the scam and the fraud part is only going to get worse as this technology continues to accelerate. Um, all right, enough about scams, Lance. Yep. Um, what trades, if any, did you guys make this week? None. Um, <laughs> we, we, uh, you know, we, we, you know, we sold our index trading positions about two weeks ago. Uh, market's been in a correction since Friday was, uh, you know, was a strong Friday. But uh, again, it was pretty much driven by Apple for the most part. There were some other participants. Uh, oil did pretty good on Friday. Banks rebounded a bit. Um, but that's kind of a reflex of bounce from a kind of a short term oversold condition. We're still on a sell signal right now. So, you know, just we're sitting a little bit of extra cash. Um, when we kind of get to the point that we get a good buy signal and market's holding support, then we'll probably take our portfolios to full weightings again. We're just not quite there yet. Okay. Um, this is this may be a conversation to explore on a, on a future podcast, but like um, it, it, we, we, we were just talking earlier about how it just seems that the banking system is going to keep consolidating until just JP Morgan, you know, owns the world, right? <laughs> yep. And we talk about these fewer and fewer number of stocks that that make up the market and uh and Apple seems to be the biggest, you know, so, you know, make it a joke, but maybe one day the market is all just, you know, one company, it's just Apple, right? It's the I don't S&P, know because it's, it's, it's the S&P 1, right? Yeah, well, maybe, but you know, the problem is is Apple's buying 90 billion a year back in stock, so you keep that up long enough, you're a trillion dollar company. Well, it only takes 10 years to buy all your stock back. So yeah, it's, that's actually really good math. But but where I'm going with this is like, you know, we 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 seem to have these parts, these sectors where there's almost kind of a winner take all mentality, right? And yeah, it might not be one company that wins. It might be a small cartel that 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 you know hoovers everything up. Um, but but you know, I don't like it, but could that be a successful investing strategy going forward, which is like just just own the cartels? Well, it, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, you know, I, like right now, I'm having a hard time with companies like McDonald's as a good example. Uh, we've talked about this before. McDonald's is a great brand. Um, you know, even McDonald's came out lately and said that customers are having trouble paying nine dollars for a hamburger at McDonald's. Mm -hmm. But you know. This company is this company has not grown sales in five years, and they trade at a nine times price to sales. Now that's tech stock territory all day long. Scott McNeely at Sun Micro said, "You're crazy paying ten times price to sales. That means I can afford to pay nobody anything, no taxes, no 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 dividends, no payroll, no health care, no nothing. Everything's got to go back to to the to the investor at ten times price to sales, and that's illegal." So. You know, there's companies that are great companies, Procter & Gamble, others, Coca-Cola, massively overpriced relative to their earnings growth and their, and their futures. Then there's companies like Monster, as a good example, Monster Beverage, which has been on a huge tear just lately, but trades at nine times price of sales, but it's growing earnings at a very rapid rate. So theoretically, they can grow into that, that sales growth, ultimately. Yep. Apple is a mature company. It can't grow sales that fast anymore, right? It just, it can't. And Microsoft is the same way. And so everybody's now banking on, well, it'll be AI. So AI is going to change everything. Well, even if, if Microsoft takes over on AI, which they're making, you know, they're just now have, have agreed to fund AMD to build more AI-centric chips, you know, that's going to be very hard to grow sales when you're that large. It's just, you know, trying to turn the mic, trying to turn the Titanic. It's just you're not going to, you have to grow sales a lot to make an incremental increase in your rate of sales growth. So there's going to be other companies out there that are going to be much better bets. Uh, you know, it's, it may be the NVIDIAs of the world, it may be the AMDs, but those are getting to be more mature companies as well. So the ones that really probably went from AI are probably companies we haven't heard of yet. Um, they're small private companies coming up. They're going to develop some great technology. They'll get absorbed or, or eventually go public. But those are going to be the ones where you'll make a lot of money. If you want to be safe, 
and play the AI, AI venture. You buy Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Apple, AMD, NVIDIA. You make a portion of your portfolio of those, you know, those four or five stocks, and you've pro probably got a bulk of the AI wind at your back. Okay. Uh, you kind of ended up answering sort of a different question um, about, hey, you know, how's the way to invest in the AI wave? Um, let's actually, if you don't mind, let's earmark that to, to dive into okay. more in a future discussion here, because um, there's getting, I don't you're probably getting the same surge I am. I'm going to start an AI portfolio probably in the next couple of weeks. So. Are you, are you jesting as you're saying that? Or are you being? Oh no, I'm, no, I'm seriously considering it. I'm, I'm trying to work through the mechanics of it right now. But I'm okay. thinking about you know building a portfolio sleeve that's kind of AI centric. Okay, yeah, because I'm getting tons of questions about just hey, what's AI's impact going to be on 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 the the general economy? But then lots and lots of questions about hey, you know, what are some ways to play this? So um, so anyways, let's let's earmark that for for once you've done your research and you feel like you've got you know yeah. good direction on that. Um, all right, great. Well, look, folks, um, as we wrap up here, um, just want to uh, remind folks of a couple of things. One, if you are interested in seeing uh, that new banking uh, sector special report while it's still fresh, um, go watch that uh, after this video. I'll put a link to it in the description below. Um, Lance did his usual great job of explaining, you know, how he's thinking of processing through this challenging market environment. Um, but, you know, the, one of the key takeaways is, is you know, if you're like most people, uh, your your better your, your neural power is better spent on saying, "How can I find the best navigator for me in this world?" as opposed to trying to figure out which stocks to buy on your own, given what a challenging environment is, how tough that is to do generally, and how most regular people who have jobs and families and other obligations just don't have a bandwidth to do that. Um, if you've got a good uh, advisor in your life who's already doing that for you, great, stick with them. But if you don't, or if you just like a second opinion of one who does take in all the factors that Lance and I have talked about here, perhaps even Lance and their team there at Real Investment Advisors, just go to Wealthion.com, fill out the short form there, have a free consultation with these guys, hear what they have to say. Um, and with that being said, uh, if you're continue to enjoy these weekly market recaps, would like to see them continue, please support this channel by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little blue icon right next to it. Lance, as usual, I'll let you have the last word on the way out here. Have a great weekend. We'll see y'all here next week. All right. Thanks so much, Lance. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching.